welcome to everyone who came out today. Uh, we realize this brown bag seminar is at a different time than normally at noon, but uh, to accommodate people's schedules, we decided to put it on one hour later. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Emma Stephens with us here today. Uh, she only just arrived in Lethbridge about two months ago. Her new position at the research station, agriculture research station, just started on July the 2nd. Uh, she had been working as a professor of economics in a, a college in, uh, in Northern California, and uh, uh, she came to the, re to the research station to replace Elwin Smith, who many of you know. Elwin Smith uh, retired just a little over a year ago, uh, and Jose Barbieri, uh, who had been there uh, working as a support person in that, uh, in that uh, office, uh, had been there. He, he just uh, retired about three years ago. But uh, so, but before Elwin was there, I was there. So uh, uh, Bernie Sontag and I were the first economists uh, seconded to uh, agriculture research stations anywhere in Canada. Um, and so I put uh, uh, her at uh, third generation. Elwin is second generation. He came after I did, and I was the first generation. I started teaching at the university at, at night uh, while I still worked at the research station. So th we've had a continuum now for many years, uh, and so we're really happy to welcome uh, uh, Emma to Lethbridge and to the agricultural research. Emma has uh, her PhD from uh, uh, Cornell University, which is situated in Ithaca, New York. I don't know how many have been to Ithaca, New York, but it's a gorgeous city. Literally. <laughs> Literally, that's a slogan. Two, two, two that's meanings of gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really gorgeous, and it's gorgeous. My PhD is from Peru. There's nothing gorgeous about myself yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, she actually uh, spent many of her early years in Lethbridge uh, before she moved away. So she's gone to school here in, uh, in the public school system earlier on in her life, and she moved away, and now she's come back. So today. Uh, she's, uh, as she's getting started with her research career at the, at the Lethbridge Research Center, we're very proud to have her to come over and, and meet us at the University of Lethbridge, and she's going to give a talk on uh, what her research has been doing up until now and how she's going to be continuing it at the, at the research station here in the area of agricultural systems analysis and food security. So Emma, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. I was so way too kind, and uh, but thank you so much, and and I appreciated um, your uh, uh, communicating with me right after I got here, and uh, that's been very helpful to get a sense of the continuity of the bioeconomics program at the at the research station. So uh, and so thank you for being so welcoming. I also. Uh, Kurt also got keys to my mother's apartment because she moved up here with us too. So, <laughs> so like the the move from California was like a logistical nightmare. So <laughs> we 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 got a lot of help from you. So I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for this invitation. It's really great to be able to come over here. This is my first uh, chance to meet some of the folks at the university. So so thank you for this. Um, as Kurt said, I uh, very new to the. Uh, research station here as their bioeconomist, um, but the description, the job description was, was too good to pass up. So uh, this is uh, the, the presentation I'm going to give you today is, is very recent work on agricultural systems modeling and its relation to food security. And it was done with an interdisciplinary team of livestock scientists, crop scientists, soil folks, and, uh, and economists as well. And that is, uh, there's a lot of scope for that at the research station. I was really intrigued and, and excited uh, about the position description there. So I'm, I'm really glad to, to be here and, and have, a, have a great um, set of colleagues to continue this kind of work. So uh, that this is, this is a great opportunity for, for me as well. Um, uh, so this is a, a project I've been working on since last summer. Um, with, a, with a group of uh, agricultural systems modelers that I've been in connection with since, since graduate school days, and we've done a, a couple of projects since then. Um, but uh, this has uh, been motivated by um, uh, a lot of uh, disciplinary differences between folks that are doing research on food security and folks that are doing research on agricultural systems. They, 
uh, we, we kind of got into this project and realized that those two big research communities are, are talking about the same thing but using very different uh, uh, ways of studying it, very different ways of thinking about the connections between the two. Uh, and there is definitely scope for uh, a project like this to try and make a go of bringing those two, two people, two, two research communities together. So there's a nutritionist, for example, on this project as well. And there's been a lot of interesting conversations on how to link up how nutritionists think about food security and nutrition versus how agricultural scientists think about food production and food security. And, and so this is conceptual, a lot of it, but we're uh, going to develop it further as, as time goes on. So this is the um, some of the, the collaborators here. Uh, Chuck Nicholson, who's the PI on this project, is a... Uh, a systems modeler and agricultural economist from Cornell. Uh, Andrew Jones is our, is our nutritionist, and he's at the University of Michigan right now, um, but does a lot of work on agriculture and nutrition, which is its own separate subfield, and um, really interesting to get his perspective. Um, I, I think he compartmentalizes it, actually, so he's talking to us about agriculture. Uh, we started working on this project. He had just come from a nutrition conference, and I said, oh, you know, that was, was, was this sort of also on the agenda? And he's like, oh, no, no. We, we weren't really at the Nutrition con Conference talking about food. They talk a lot about health impacts, very, very micro level aspects after the food is consumed, but not like where the food is coming from. So it was super interesting. Anyway, so I got to know Andy through this project. Birgit Kupansky is another economist. Uh, systems modeler, very interested in the intersection of food security and, and agriculture as well. David Parsons is a crop modeler, uh, essentially, um, uh, at Sweden University. James Garrett uh, is another uh, researcher on, on food security, um, uh, so more inter interdisciplinary work there. And then me, uh, I, I forgot to change that. Anyway, I guess I'm not at Pitzer College anymore, but that's where I was before. And this has been supported by um, the the uh, climate change and for food security group through the CGI and AR. Uh, so this is who I'm working with here. Um, uh, this is our, our essential motivation is that uh, the, the two research communities are, are talking about food security in very different ways. In particular, I think most of the folks on the project, maybe with the exception of Andy, uh, are coming from the agricultural production, agricultural systems side. And food security is often a big motivator for the work that they do, um, but they don't have much to draw on in terms of measuring whether they've achieved a food security objective. Um, so uh, it usually boils down to increasing yields or some, some, something that's measurable on the production side, but it's not necessarily, there isn't a good way to link that up with the other aspects of food security that nutrition, food security people will be thinking about. And so this is part of what we're doing. Um, so we, we did a, a very large literature review to really investigate how many, in particular, agricultural sy systems models mentioned food security. And then once they did that, you know, how did they talk about it? And is that recognizable to Andy, our, our nutritionist, our food security person on the project? And, and for the most part, it going beyond yields was, was a stretch. So you'll see the kind of winnowing down of the literature there. And then the next thing, we've broken it up now. This is a working paper, and now we're just planning on submitting it um, uh, into two. One is the overall review, and the other is going to be these proof of concept exercises. So uh, we have two actual existing agricultural systems models and then we extended them to put food security indicators into them or sort of to see how easy or difficult it is uh, and use that as a way to uh, think about well, what, what, did, what would we have liked to, what data would we like to have to be able to do that and what are we missing uh, just um, as, as a proof of concept. Um, and realizing, of course, that we're doing something as an experiment, basically, and it's, we're not saying this is the best way to do it. We just attempted to do it and then looked at what the implications might be for the kinds of agricultural systems analysis that you would do if you had these food security indicators linked in and what different kinds of questions you would be able to answer. So that's what we, um, we did. We also wanted to uh, uh, emphasize low middle income country settings. 
uh, because of the large proportion of folks who are in agricultural enterprises and a large prevalence of food insecurity in, in, in those settings. And so um, that, this is, that was uh, another part of the, the, the literature review focus. Um, so just, uh, yeah, I don't have a good sense of the audience, so some of you might be more, this is news to some of you, but maybe not the economists, not the ag, uh, ag researchers necessarily, but this is one definition of, of food security. There's, it's not the only one, and people can test it a little bit, but um, we went off of this framework from the FAO, the four pillars. So you, it's not enough to say uh, if a population has sufficient availability of food, that that's equivalent to food security. Uh, because it doesn't deal with the next step, once the food is produced, how it actually turns into consumption and then turns into nutrition. So these other pillars have been uh, added on as uh, components of this. So uh, from a logical standpoint, I guess like food, food availability, which is supply side, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for food security. So it kind of, it has a hierarchy attached to it, but it's not the only part. Access um, is uh, making the, the distinction that the, the food that's produced has to go through markets or some other mechanism to actually get into the hands of people to be consumed as food. Uh, and there are differential levels of access across uh, spatial dimensions, across uh, socioeconomic dimensions, within household distribution issues are also part of access, so you have uh, for an agricultural survey, you would have, let's say, food production measured at a household level. Um, but in terms of food security and nutrition or health impacts of having access to food, you would want to look at that at an individual level, but then you have to ask questions about once the food's produced, how is it distributed amongst people in the household. So those are access questions. Um, utilization is another distinct aspect that deals a lot with quality of food. So. Uh, you could have enough food, you could have a distribution that, that is relatively equal, uh, but the food is of differential quality and the utilization aspect is that's, that's going to not lead to as high of a health impact as high quality food that's well distributed and produced in sufficient quantities. And so utilization is a separate, um, a separate category. It also relies a lot on um, uh, complementary uh, factors, so it doesn't just deal with food anymore. Do you have access to clean water? Do you have access to uh, other related systems that allow you to guarantee the quality of the food? You have storage, if you're a farmer, you're, you have storage technology that allow you to save, save food for a long period of time. Um, so that's another uh, aspect. And then stability is the last component. So it's again, even if those three, first three pillars are satisfied, if they're not on a consistent basis available, then you would also say you're not food secure. You can't just have it one day, and then the next day, so some dimension of that falls apart. So, um, but it, it turns it's interesting, because it turns out that stability is like, you don't want it to be stable in a bad way. So <laughs> this is something we ended up wrestling with, like stability, I, I, after going through this project, it's like a concept that I think we have the most trouble with. You don't want it to be stable bad. You want it to be upwardly unstable, I guess is how I like to put it, right? Food security, unstable, but in a, in a positive direction. So this one is, this one is, it was, was tough to reconcile with other, um, maybe normative properties of food production and distribution and things like that. So uh, that, was, that was something that came out of this project too. Um, on the agricultural system side, so again, not sure um, exactly what, if this is, well, this is not a very good diagram. <laughs> Agricultural system is like the most abstract capturing of all of the potential systems related questions that you might have. So uh, McConnell and Dylan have this big summary piece that gets referenced a lot of the times. This is how they put it, and I, I liked it just because it covers like everything. So you can have a systems related question across the levels. So like at the top there, you've got the different industries and you can have kind of a systems analysis looking at like trade-offs between food production and cash crop production, something like that. Or you could have another system that's built in the vertical direction, like between, between the crop and then what happens at the household level and trying to sort of circle a couple of the levels at the same time and build a system around that, recognizing the interrelationships there. And so we've realized we had to define agricultural systems too to sort of put a scope. So it's not agricultural economics necessarily. It's 
uh, has a much uh, maybe larger emphasis on the natural science component um, and the interplay between the economics and the decision making about food specifically uh, and what the natural system is is being how it's being modeled let's say uh, and, and, and the interplay there so I'm trying to link those things together um, and uh, and then this is part of the motiva motivation so I like I like this so this was one of the fun thing fun things that came out of doing this so if you this is so there's this and then there's there's then there's this and it's like there's like a hundred diagrams that are all different about the food system like this one like what's the relationship between <coughs> food security and, and food and food production so I like so I did that gave this talk at the research station and I asked the researchers to find themselves in these in this picture so you can find yourselves in this picture if you're coming from different disciplines. They're very complicated pictures. This one, this this one's the best one. Okay, so this, <laughs> so this, so this is this is the food system, global food system. This is like the compendium diagram of absolutely everything in the food. They put it all in there. So find your favorite symbol. I was trying to prepare for this talk last night. I'm like, I know there's a cow in there. Yeah, there's the cow. There's the cow. Okay. So. <laughs> um, so the researchers at the station, you know, you put themselves like here, maybe? Like my colleagues at the, at the research station, like on the, on the production side, the science of the producing the food. But then it, because the two kind of literatures don't really talk to each other, like food is not food. Like agricultural yields are not food, right? And it's not food security. There's all this other things that determine food security. And so we're all in this much bigger system. Uh, but the problem with this, or this is the narrowing down of this project anyway, between this and this and this is like, if you're a system person and a system modeler and you're kind of quantitatively oriented, like what does this tell you about, like if you wanted to have a joint model of food security and agricultural systems, these diagrams are so diverse that they, they don't give you enough guidance on like how, let's see, like home production. So we're talking about low income setting. Like what's the size, is this arrow really the same size as these other arrows? Is it always one way? What's the actual functional form underneath that? To build it into a model to make it, make it start functioning, you have to give the model a lot of information to make it actually simulate an agricultural system, and this, that piece is really missing. So these frameworks have all been developed for a lot of different reasons, not necessarily quantitative modeling of an agricultural system plus food security. And so this is, this is basically um, where, we, where we started, is that this is not, and then there's this one. I love this one. I don't even really know what it means. <laughs> Like, it's like an iterative process, like it never ends, your, your decision-making process about the food system. Like it keeps feeding back onto each other and there's signals going back and forth between the decisions you made and the food security outcomes and then you kind of go back and adjust. And not how, not how economists, I would say, necessarily think about it either. Like it's very iterative and uh, <coughs> updating and more like Bay Bayesian sort of types approaches of re readjusting um, your model uh, constantly in a circle. Okay, um, and so, um, uh, and then I, I worked with some of these folks um, previously on, on a related topic and um, uh, putting together a special issue uh, from the Second International Conference on Global Food Security. So again, we were very underrepresented in that conference being on the agricultural production side. So that conference is more food security researchers, nutritionists, uh, people looking farther down the value chain, basically, of like the, the consequences of food distribution on health. Um, and we kind of went through all the papers that were submitted to this enormous conference, and we only found 10 that had any real substantial agricultural content, which is really surprising. Uh, and so um, uh, we tried to highlight that, but there's a lot more to be explored on that. Um, uh, so I put together my own framework, own framework as sort of as part of that. Like, so once you started, like, how should you think about the relationship between agricultural production and food? And then we realized that's why we ended up focusing on a low middle income setting is that it really depends on the market structure. Uh, if you're talking about a, a system that's a self-contained, a subsistence system that doesn't have very much market access, 
that those three systems are very tightly linked to one another. Uh, food security is contained in the agricultural system that's sort of dominating the production system of, of a subsistence producer. But once you have markets that allow you to specialize, you don't have to rely only on your own production for food security, get a lot of your food like maybe from, from a supermarket or like a local uh, food, food provider, then you have these very split up decisions. You can you can focus on uh, supply side profit profit generating on your farm, and then have food security guaranteed in a different way. So if you look at farmers here, let's say um, just sort of learning about more about the Canadian production system, but it's true also in the states. It's most a lot of farmers that most of their income is not from farming, and I, I kind of relate it to this in my mind. Like they're producing to generate profits, but they also earn money in a secondary occupation, and that brings in cash. That has nothing to do with agricultural production at all, but helps them to guarantee food security. You know what I mean? So, um, so we realized we had to sort of distinguish between the different market uh, settings that we're thinking about. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we focused on, on this particular type of agricultural system. Uh, where there might be tighter linkages, um, uh, and then wanted to review existing ways of thinking about it. So on the agricultural system side, when those models were developed, what were they thinking about food security at the time, um, and uh, and then use some models that we uh, were part of the team uh, building. So I was uh, with uh, Chuck Nicholson and David Parsons. Uh, we built the classes model of a subsistence farming system in Kenya. It's a mixed enterprise, has some livestock, has corn, and a cash crop, and then uh, that can be one of the proof of concept at the household level. And this is another model that Chuck and uh, David Parsons built at the regional level, so we wanted to think about whether that made a difference in the proof of concept exercise. So this is a sector by sector of more commercial um, sheet meat production in Mexico, um, and then we kind of exposed these models. We adjusted them to include food security, and then shocked the model, as, as, which is pretty standard practice, but looked at not just the production side impacts of that, but also the food security impacts once we've done that. Okay. okay. Um, just really uh, briefly, just the pictures, I think, probably say most of this, is that the, the existing frameworks linking up agriculture and food security are, are very diverse, um, not, not very quantitative, uh, and don't provide enough guidance from the agricultural systems perspective on how to go further. A lot of, I think a lot of agricultural systems researchers want to think about food security and they're motivated by food security, but the, but the, the frameworks out there talking about food security don't, that can't, can't provide enough guidance on how to actually go about doing that. So that was our main, our main discovery. Um, uh, and, uh, Model boundaries, which is very important in systems work, like what you really want to contain your, your, your inquiry to, or are, are very like the, the big part picture that I showed you, and that's global, that's the global boundary. So that is important to have that documented and to have a conversation about all those pieces and feel like that that got uh, documented, but it's it's very hard to do research at that scale. So. Um, so we, we narrowed it down between the four pillars. We, we kind of had a discussion about food security indicators that kind of reflect those four pillars and which ones would be easiest to do the proof of concept. And we realized utilization uh, was not one of them. Just because we didn't have the empirical basis for all of the nutrition health aspects associated with utilization to realistically get anywhere on building it into the model. Uh, we didn't want to add to the model the entire kind of water access system that would go with it, let's say, or uh, health services or anything that would be also um, very closely related to the utilization pillar. And so it's an incomplete exercise because ideally you would like to have all of those in there because they're all important components of food security, but we focused on just extending it a little bit and adding access and stability. Um, and so as a, uh, as a contribution, I'd say uh, agricultural systems models have a lot of tools for talking about stability and maybe in, in a way that's, that would be useful to the food security community. 
And so that was a, that was a, a, a good um, uh, target. And I think that uh, food access was was more difficult, right? like more comfortable with thinking about the stability of, a, of an agricultural system and then how that relates to food security stability. That was a, maybe a closer connection than thinking about food access. Okay, so the um, uh, common indicators of food access, but again, there's, there's, there's a lot of them, but these are the ones that we chose here. We took a couple. Food consumption expenditures. So moving beyond how much food you produce to what was done on the demand side in terms of your budgetary expenditures on food. Um, we added that in, we felt like we could get some parameters on prices, some demand elasticities based on income earned on the farm, which is what we ended up doing, and then translate that in a realistic way to consumption expenditures as one dimension of access. So it went beyond just your supply to some way to model the choices that a household might have made on that. Okay, so that, that uh, was the first one. And then we took two more. Uh, so the food insecurity experience scale uh, has been uh, standardized and collected uh, through the Gallup World Poll, for example, there's been a, and I think it's been included in this, the, uh, uh, the, the recent um, update, the Sustainable World Development Goals, as a metric of food security to be, to be collected in every possible instance, to be able to talk about food security in the same way across a lot of different settings. So the food insecurity experience scale, does anybody know what it is? Has seen it or? Um, okay, um, it's a eight question module, um, uh, I think it was developed by the FAO, where it talks from one to eight questions of, of increasing food insecurity, but it's, it is an experiential, a, a so-called a, a psychometric measure. So the first questions talk about, do you, do you experience any anxiety about your ability to access food? And uh, it's, it's a yes or no, one zero. Uh, so there are a couple of questions talking about, are you worried about it? Do you experience anxiety about it? The next sort of level moderate food insecurity indicators are, did you reduce the amount of food that you consumed? Did you consume less than you wanted? Like you had some benchmark and then you felt in this time period that we're talking to you about that you consumed less than what was, what was optimal for your household. And then the last sort of most severe indicators are, are like skipping of meals. Uh, did, did people not get food at, at all in this, over this particular time frame? How often did that happen? Um, questions like that. And uh, this has been uh, validated. So those questions, you can imagine, uh, are very subjective. And uh, so it's been a lot of effort to try to think about this measure and validate it um, psychologically across many different groups of people, and I feel like it does, a, it, it captures what Andy, my colleague, would call the construct of food insecurity. Um, well, across multiple very, uh, very different groups of people, across, um, uh, across, across nations, rural, urban, things like that. So they feel like those questions that they've picked versus other things that they could have asked, let's say, those ones seem to be reflecting food insecurity in a common way across a lot of different settings. Uh, and then how it gets used in practice, um, sometimes it's added up, so you could have a score from one to eight, and higher scores are associated with categorizing yourself uh, or the population that you're looking at into high food insecurity, medium, and, and zero. If you, if you have a lot of zeros, then, then those are your food secure people that's within your, within your sample. Um, uh, and then other kind of breakdowns, because they're asking about different things. So I, I, I've done related work. There are some folks at the research station, actually, who are also looking at food insecurity uh, using the Gallup World Poll data. And it doesn't always net out that someone's answering an aid and they, you can have someone getting a score of two is the issue, like, because they answered a one on like the lowest sort of food insecurity question and then a one on the highest. But it's very different too someone who answered the two to just saying they're worried or they have anxiety, but they're not actually at the point of skipping meals. And so there's work being done now, try to break it down a little bit more and say, well, what are those portfolios of food insecurity really telling you? Yes? May, may I ask? Yes. 
Uh, <clears throat> so basically, this this measure is heavily dependent on income, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's. So this is yeah, on studies like that. This is a dependent variable. They're trying to operationalize it and then relate it to income, gender, your employment status. Okay, Do you sure. live in a city versus in the yes? Right. So the, the food security is just at the very very micro micro level, individual household. Yeah. Okay. The, this is yeah. gathered in the Gallup roll call. This is individual level responses. Okay. Yes, person to person. So you can have people in the same household. Yes. Um, so that, yeah, a lot of work is being done on trying to find the correlates of what the responses are. The um, dietary diversity scale is, is uh, it's not a psychometric measure, but it's asking about consumption of different kinds of uh, food categories with sub sort of supporting research that more diverse diets are associated with better food security and better health outcomes than less diverse diets. So it's a way to capture that. But it has it suffers from the same problem where a two is not a two. Like you have someone who's consuming a lot of grains and meat gets a two. Someone's just uh, doing junk, junk food and grains also gets a two. Like it's, it's different, right? So, um, uh, so, so uh, and I, I don't know. And this this kind of operationalization I've seen it in agriculture too. So like on biodiversity, trying to do counts of species across plots. But twos are not two. Like if you, if you have like a fly and an ant, it's a two. Versus like you've got a rare species in an ant, like that's also a two. Like so, it's better than not do, trying to do it or trying to link up with the quantitative research that's being done. But it's hard. It's hard to operationalize the concept. So with that, uh, I might bring in, uh, you got an arrow up by culturally acceptable. Does that figure in with the diversity scale? Uh, yes, um, yes. Uh, uh, so you can imagine in some instances what is available uh, is not culturally acceptable. So whoever's in charge of supplying the food is not necessarily the same group that's, that's consuming the food. So there are dietary restrictions based on culture, based on religion, and you can you can have that be a barrier to access. So if you have even a lot though of beef in India, for example. Yeah. Um, or there, 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 yes. And if you have a very distinct supply chain versus your uh, group that is that is most of the, the the bulk of the consumers in an area, if if they are coming from different different groups, then you can have culturally unacceptable. Or at a or at a particular time of year, let's say things like that. So it's important to acknowledge all the reasons why people are able to access or not access food, um, and that's, that's definitely one of them. So, um, so yeah, on this we we kind of got to that that gray square there. Can we bullet, take our model up to that point where we can look at the food that came from the agricultural system that we're looking at, and then how it might have gotten allocated to individuals within that system, but then not ask questions beyond that, like, was it good quality, bad quality, what were the health impacts of that, um, which is which is farther on the, to the right on that um, continuum. Okay. Um, and these two last, <clears throat> these are more our contributions going the other direction. So um, uh, Birgit, my, my colleague, uh, uh, provide a lot of the background on, on these resilience metrics. So uh, it's like a stress test for your system model, and it can be applied. It doesn't have to just be this it could be for, for anything. Uh, and sort of standardized ways of looking at system responses to shocks. So uh, hardness is one um, way that we're trying to capture stability. So the hardness is, did it adjust very much? You shock it, but it didn't, didn't really move that much. It's a relatively hard system. Versus elasticity, maybe it moved a lot, but then it returned to its former state. Versus what I'll show you in a second, some of the models didn't. The shock was enough to push them into a, a different state. So uh, not very elastic. OK, yeah, this was our long literature search. <laughs> Like a less than ten percent success rate. <laughs> Sorry, on the household level, nine hundred. And guess who was reading the nine hundred ninety-seven abstract? 
So, <laughs> and then it got down to 84. That had some. So that's that's why you know we we just sort of made our got ourselves a job for the next couple of years anyway. Like this is this is an issue. Like at the end, we're like want to write back to all those authors and say you put food security in your keywords. But in the end, your model didn't really do anything in terms of food security, or you put agricultural yields in your keywords, and it didn't really have anything to do with agriculture either. So there's this big uh, assumption about that as a motivation and whether you're capturing it or not, on, on, I'd say on the agriculture side and the food security side. So, um, and you can kind of break it down. The ones that did talk about it at all are food security motivated, but no modeling attempt of food security. So it's just saying, this should improve food security, but I'm not testing that in any particular way. But I do know it probably has something to do with yields, and this will generally result in higher food security. A statistical analysis of agricultural system variables. So for ag econ, most of the ag econ papers would fall, I'd say, into this category, like a, a regression model of, uh, you have a household survey that has some natural science component, like you, you, you have some soil quality variables, let's say, or yield variables or something to do with your the, the, the land size or quality. And then you also have the FICE. So you could say this farm is relatively rich in agricultural uh, inputs, seems to be associated with higher food security. But then like the chain, like how it got there is like not modeled at all. So there's like a statistical relationship. Yeah. The, uh there's kind of a, an ideological disconnect here, though, as well, because a lot of the food security literature is not about being part of a system. In fact, they don't want to be part of a system because systems sure. fail. Okay. Right? So when you're in the interior of BC and there's a big snowfall, and pretty soon the shelves are empty, you want something to be able to go to that isn't part of that system. Mm. And so a lot of the, uh, the systems that get set up, small s kind of systems, mm. are how do we feed ourselves when the big system fails. Okay. So it's not about the big system, it's how do we make sure that we've got kind of a, a fail-safe or a plan B okay. sort of piece. Okay. So you probably find a lot of the literature is not speaking to you in what you want to hear because that's really where they are. Yeah. Or, but that's, I guess for me, that's still a system. It's just not the yeah, it's a smaller system, it's an in independent system, but it's still, mm -hmm. if what that means to them, that they're producing some of their own food, right. would you characterize it that way, mm -hmm. what you're referring to? Then I, I think it would, if they managed to model both the food production and the security impacts at the household level, mm -hmm. I hope that we would capture it. I don't know if we did. But these are, these are but, not people that model things. Okay. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, maybe we would, anyway, yeah, no, I, I agree. There's, there's, Probably we couldn't capture all the appropriate search terms, so there's literature on that that, that I, I'm sure we, we missed it. Yes. See, my, my my guess is that well, when they do this, they assume somehow the existing of food available and how you deal with it when there's a shortage come. Right. So they they don't model from where the the, the production of food come. They just assume that the existing production of food available, for example, if you have a shop come in, and so your food is completely empty, shelf, grocery empty the shelf, the question is, how do we manage to get those food? But you're assuming there is somewhere the food available. Mm. Now they, they don't look at the big, big system. Right? They look at a small system there, they assume that wherever it is, the food always can be available, produced, and available, can they get it to us with, with that? And for me, I, every time I think about food security, I'm thinking of the bigger system in the sense that how do you get that food? Right. Where is produced? So can you produce them under harness, under random shot? Can you still produce to provide the, the food for the populations? That's usually the term food security. That's the first thing I'm thinking. I'm thinking more of a global scale than a, than a micro scale. Mm -hmm. And then that's why typically most people do the food security, they look at a very small system, and they look at nutrition, for example, assuming, well, you assume the food that exists there before you talk about nutrition. And there's lack of nutrition is part of the food security also. Yeah. Uh, but in my mind, I think well, what you look at is it's a big system. Is this the most important thing? Because that's the one that generates all the food security down the chain. Because without that, 
You get on top of food security, nutrition, and something like that, you cannot produce anything. Mm -hmm. And and <laughs> yeah, but but that's also like the nece necessary but not sufficient part. Yeah. So I agree. I agree. But the spatial aspect is is really interesting because there's multiple ways uh, to resolve food insecurity depending on whether you think that it's dependent on producing a certain proportion of your own food, like what, what you're saying, and yeah, versus, versus you have you always have access to markets to get, there's always food somewhere, yeah. it's just a question of how expensive it is to ship it to where you are. And so um, uh, I'd say what, I, what our hope is that we can have different conversations or more conversations about like that, that, that trade-off if you put the two things together. Because I'd say what I think we found is, is we really, the link between the food production and the food security of the people who consumed that food that was produced in that agricultural system, there's just so many linkages that have not been modeled. So there's either an assumption that uh, more food produced leads to food security, but if you don't worry about distribution, then you really, you don't, you don't know. So I... Yeah, I like uh, so. Ag Canada is is talking a lot about like the the most food insecure groups are in the extreme north in Canada, and it's this question entirely. Like, how should that be resolved? Should we try to produce more food in the north? We have the technology to do that. It's very expensive. Or should we focus on the trade, shipping food from where it's cheaper to ship it, and getting it like putting our efforts into that. Yeah, but, but when you talk about that, the markets become a place very important role because yeah. the price and so on and you know, trade policy and so on, you, you get into a, a very complex. Uh, uh, right, uh, yeah. I agree. I don't have any solution to that, unfortunately, but, 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 I, but I think that it would, the conversation, if you tr try to do what we did, you don't have to believe me or, or accept what I'm saying. But I think that part of the issue is we're not modeling that whole thing together. Especially with uh, on the agricultural production side, there's a lot of expertise on the very detailed relationships between uh, the natural system supporting food production and yields, but, but not very much after that. Like what happens to all of that? So like if we spend a lot of money on increasing the yields of like canola or something. Uh, you can see that that's not necessarily gonna have a very direct relationship to food security. It's like through the indirect route of providing incomes in an industry that gives people food security. So it's, yeah, but once you get, but then we have to export that thing and then import something else and that becomes very complicated. Um, so anyway, these are the different kind of classifications that, that we have. So the, the last one is the one where we felt it actually met the criteria simultaneously modeling the system, agricultural system and the food security, but those are very, about, yeah, about five papers in the end. <laughs> on, this, on the household side. And then we re the regional aspect is also super important, so we, we did a separate search on regional systems, of regional food systems, or regional agricultural production, and the results are similarly dismal in terms of hits. So 646 papers looking at regional level yields of some some, like at a landscape level, let's say, like at Southern Alberta, agricultural production, like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but very little in the way of, of linking that to, and I mean, it's already regional scale, so it's hard to link it to individual level food security. But you, you could, but nobody has seemed to be doing that. That's where, we, that's where we're at. Okay, okay, so more, more silly pictures. So this is the, um, this is the classes model. This is the household level model of a smallholder Kenyan mixed enterprise system. So uh, they have uh, the ability to produce in this model. They have uh, maize, they have tea as their crop. They have a napier grass also as a forage crop for the livestock. They can have livestock if they choose to invest in that, but it doesn't have to. And it's as a uh, season to season updating and they look at the marginal returns to the different enterprises and then decide whether they want to make an investment or not. So the, the farm is modeled as like 10 plots, and the farmer every season is looking at, well, what's the return to labor in doing maize versus doing tea in this plot? And if it's higher, they will gradually switch one proportion of the farm over 
and the, or switch back if, if things change. They can have different shocks uh, to the different enterprises. Um, and they can invest, uh, take cash that accumulates in a stock, and they can invest in livestock, things like that. Um, this is a system dynamics model, so if this is not familiar, uh, it's a process-based model that's based on stocks and flows and feedback. So there are six kind of fundamental system behaviors that a system dynamic model can capture. Um, one is like exponential growth. So you can build a model of stocks and flows that has a positive reinforcing loop over and over again, and then the, the system of interest will exponentially grow. You can have collapse um, uh, or, or deterioration to some equilib equilibrium baseline. So you can have it going exponentially decaying in a different direction. You can have oscillation. Uh, you can have overshoot and collapse. So if the positive reinforcing loop is moving faster than the balancing loop, then it will kind of accumulate beyond system limits, and then you can model the collapse, and then you can kind of have a stable. Um, and then there's also the S-curve. Uh, so we were looking here uh, when we built this model for poverty traps, which um, uh, is, uh, uh, we were looking for natural capital-based poverty traps. So poverty traps literature at, from the development literature is, is, is saying that there's, there's a strong, stable, set of equilibriums and investment without paying attention to the to the other kind of reinforcing loops, balancing loops, is not going to get a household out of one one equilibrium. So usually they are welfare ranked, so there's a low level equilibrium. Uh, the farmers that provided us with the data to, to parameterize this model are basically subsistence farmers, a couple of hectares of production, relatively low income, and not very high yields. Um, what we were looking for, we built in enough combination of the natural system. So the soil scientists were looking at degradation of the soil for these different enterprises. But on the economic side, we have market access. We have price, uh, price changes, price shocks. So we were looking at whether uh, including the economic data could shock the natural system out of a low level equilibrium trap on the natural capital side and what are, what are those interrelationships there. Um, and so, but there's no food security in here necessarily. It's still about agricultural production. Uh, so we tried to link in those three measures into this model using their ways to, to attach the variables we know that are important to food security coming from this into, um, into, into the model as it is. So um, we ran the model with two different household types, one that's relatively resource poor, small, uh, not very much cash on hand to invest in different kinds of activities, uh, not consuming a, a large deal of food, um, has uh, relatively low diet diversity, um, a lower uh, food insecurity experience, experience scale, um, and then a larger double size in terms of the size of the farm and increase some of the other important assets and then we'll see what would happen. Okay. Um, so these are our, our three measures. So we wanted to, but again, we, we, once we started doing this, we don't, the literature just stops in terms of like, what should the functional form be for the demand of food of a household that's like this? So we, we used one, but as, as I say, it's not optimal, we would like to test say, is the Cobb-Douglas form appropriate? Constant elasticity, what, what's the best way to model food demand in a subsistence household? We, we, we found something that will, will, will work in the model, but we didn't do any testing necessarily of other forms and whether they would also work. So yeah, these are the actual <laughs> actual forms that we use. Um, some of them, uh, this is this is a basically a demand function, and the factors that are in there are things that we know from the rest of the literature are important correlates of consumption of food. So your income, uh, the amount of savings you have. So they're trying to guarantee a certain level of consumption, and if the income earned from the farm doesn't get them enough money to pay for that food, then they can draw down savings. But if they run out of savings, then they start consuming less. So tried to structure it a little bit the way the responses of the food insecurity scale is, is structuring relative deterioration in food security. Some of these other are just switches, really. Like, um, 
if your earnings go above a certain threshold, you add one to your diversity score. So you start with some baseline level, try to characterize what amount of income is probably associated with consuming one more food group and then another up to the, up to the limit. Same with land size, um, education. These are all things that came out of the literature review as being important correlates. But how to operationalize them again is, was that was our, our challenge. So this was this was worth about ten years years of education so as a split a stepping stone. That's right. That's right. Um, and the prices calculated in the same time. <coughs> okay. So what it, what happened? So we shocked the model in the way that we did when we were working with the model in the first place. Um, on a yield shock after, um, let me see, it's, it's a quarterly uh, uh, assessment or time step for the model. So after two years, we hit the yield on the farm with, uh, I think, like a 50% drop, like pretty extreme, you know, like something that, that you would hope would never happen. Um, and then looked at um, what happened to consumption expenditures as one of our indicators of food security as a result, and then tried to see how, what, what that would additionally tell us. Um, the, the pointy ones are the actual consumption expenditure, and this, this square one is the prices paid for food. Sorry about that. Um, and so there's a reason we put both of these on there together. So the higher resourced household has more money and can spend more money on food. The bumps along the way are because we have a seasonal, there's a two season growing season in, in, the, in the region of study. So um, uh, food consumption expenditures are going up and down because they're producing more corn in the main season than the dry season and that impacts their income and the amount that they can consume. But overall, it's higher than the, than the blue household. And then you have this yield shock and that collapses income enough to the point that the consumption expenditures are also falling. But this gray and the black line is the higher resourced household, so this is where we're getting at some of the stability. Eventually it goes back to baseline. So they kind of recover from the shock, and they go back to their previous pattern of behavior. But the, the blue and the red lines, they don't necessarily go back, so we've got this bouncing up and down of the consumption expenditures. And actually what happened in this simulation is they lost so much money due to the yield shock that they turned from being a net, <coughs> net seller of maize to a net buyer of maize. And when you do that, the actual price you have to pay for food goes up. So you're not, you're not supplying your own um, food anymore. You're forced to go to the market more often. And when you do that, it's more expensive. So that system was not resilient to that shock. And they actually ended up uh, having a lot more variable uh, food consumption and paying more uh, than if the system was able to return to baseline. And it had a bunch of other impacts. So this household... Um, Um, I thought I would show it here, but uh, it had other impacts. So what it forced the household to do actually is work more off farm. And in the end, it had a, a positive impact on some aspects of food security because they ended up getting a job off the farm that wasn't dependent on food at all. And they can use that income the way we built it to actually have a more guaranteed access to food based versus producing it themselves. So that system changed quite a bit. A higher resourced household was able to maintain its main enterprise as being uh, a farming household, um, but maybe with, a, with, with sort of a surprising impact on food, in, food insecurity, they, they, that doesn't change very much for them. But this big shock, it's hard to get over, but we're, we modeled it so the household did get over it and was able to get over it, which is not with food insecurity, at some level it's not always possible, but they transitioned out of farming to the point that they had better food security than they did when they started. So, um, yeah, that's these these red and the blue. That's, uh, yeah, I guess that's part of what that's showing here. So these are kind of following each other. This is the yield shock here and the decline in diet diversity associated with the yield shock. But then, like, way at the end, their diet diversity goes up just because they're accessing different types of food from the market. So some of it was, like, fruits and vegetables, things that they didn't produce. And they never had enough money to buy those things before. Um, but the, uh, the higher resource cost will return to the baseline. And same with the FIES, the food insecurity. Um, the blue and the red are my lower resourced household. And food insecurity is actually like going down, but it comes, becomes like more unstable. They're sort of like in and out of the market. 
as opposed to this household having sort of a relatively big increase in food insecurity and then returning to baseline after that. I'm sorry, the green line represents the higher household. This is the, the household with the larger farm, more resources. So lower food insecurity for them. A temporary uptick in food insecurity is associated with the yield shock. This gray line here, but then it comes back down. And they continue on. You can't see a distinction between the household before and after the shock. At some point, they recover. Uh, but the behavior of the lower resourced household ends up being quite different, just simply because of this big change in their uh, livelihood strategy as a result of the shock. So uh, questions that are different to ask about those things simultaneously and trying to explore the relationship between food security and, uh, and agricultural systems. Um, so these are my uh, resilience metrics. So hardness and elasticity, relatively large elasticity, particularly for the, um, this is an average here, for the larger resource household could sort of snap back to its original position. Uh, but the low hardness means it didn't take much to disturb the system in the first place. It's just the elasticity is telling you whether it came back uh, to the way it was before. Okay. Um, this is another system dynamics model. Of, this is the regional model of the sheep production, so more um, commercially oriented, but also trying to get some variation in the kinds of producers. So um, they, we have two average producers in here. One is called Traspatio, which is a small scale family operation. Sheep, they're still mostly selling. They're not eating all of the, uh, the livestock, uh, uh, the meat that they're producing. They're much smaller scale versus large commercial producers of sheep meat in a particular region in Mexico that tends to supply the market in, in Mexico City. So it's looking at the uh, impact of uh, a shock to this system and food security if we could try to link them together. Um, <coughs> and this one, uh, we just very reduced form, just basic elasticities. So whatever food insecurity metric we're using, there's just percentage change in incomes earned from the farmers in the different systems, translating to a percentage change in food security. Um, uh, and took some parameters from the literature and didn't go farther than that and testing that with data for actual farmers in the system. So just wanted to see what would happen. Okay, <clears throat> so this is cereal grains expenditures. And um, the uh, the large producers are my green. So these are, the green line is my commercial producers, so very large scale, um, and uh, a subsidy to uh, the commercial scale. So the, this original paper was trying to compare the uh, sort of an unequal subsidy program from the Mexican government on food uh, on meat production that was only targeting the large commercial producers but still has an impact on the trust patio producers because they're all in the same market together, okay? So temporarily, uh, the large producers, uh, if that's sort of an average expenditure, they're consuming more because they're making more money as a result of the subsidy that's helping them to produce, uh, but then they kind of return back to baseline. Um, the small-scale producers are sort of going up uh, and then stabilizing uh, at a particular level. So very differential behavior across the scale uh, whether the system returns to um, what it was. Because since it's a regional model, eventually the subsidy increases demand for meat, so prices start to go up. And there's market level effects, or general equilibrium effects associated with the shock to subsidies to the production. But then, um, well. the time scale is in uh, month? Sorry, months, yeah, yes. Like months. months, okay. yes. <clears throat> And dietary diversity pattern looks the same just because we have a very simplistic formula there. So the, the kind of changes in dietary diversity is sort of a temporary change and it goes back to um, uh, after, after price shocks uh, move into the system, um, uh, we go back, the large producers kind of go back to the level of diet diversity that they had before, but the small scale producers um, are kind of riding the coattails of this big increase in the market and they aren't consuming more And food insecurity, same thing. Uh, it goes, goes down and sort of returns to baseline for the large producers. But there's a, a system-wide 
change or a food security system change for the small scale producers at a permanently lowered level of food insecurity? This is just a one period, one period temporary shock, right? I'd have to go back to the paper. I don't think it's a one month. I think it's over a, over a couple of months, a sustained subsidy program. But I can't, I can't remember exactly. No, 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 it's fine. It's just a, have you, have you think about what happened if it's a systems shock? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we haven't done that experiment, though. No. But yes, you could. You could. Uh, if there was, a, but it did end. I guess if that's the answer to your question. It wasn't a permanent change in, in government policy. Okay, but again, uh, a lot more, like a reverse of the previous one, a lot more hardness in the system, so it takes a lot for the system to really display a lot of sensitivity to the change, but not very much elasticity, so once it does change, then it, it can, it, especially for the small scale producer, the trust patio producers, it moves to a different mode of uh, So we're trying to keep working on this, um, getting down to more categorization of what are the data gaps that we observed in trying to do this, like sort of demand functions, how can we actually model it so it's better representing people within these systems? The humans in these agricultural systems are not very well modeled. That's, I feel like that's going to be my job at the agricultural research station, modeling humans. So <laughs> that would be really cool. Um, and I think economists in general have problems with that. What's that? I think economists in general have problems with that. <laughs> I, yes, I, uh, I, I share your skepticism. We probably won't get very far. But, um, uh, so, but trying to also do presentations like this and like talk to people in the both research communities um, and look for particular leverage points. Like if you model both the production and the food security simultaneously, can you get particular points of leverage to improve both of those things? So just on that, um, this is a, a paper that came out in Nature last year. So put that in. it's the first day of international climate strikes. So trying to mainstream environmental discussions into all of this and nutrition and security people, food security people are also trying to do the same thing. So maybe work like this could mainstream both of those things. So this is coming at it. This is a group of food security and nutritionists going the other direction. So they're very concerned with our current patterns of demand for food and then backing out what are the environmental implications of that. Um, with zero change, the red lines, this is it's not the greatest graph is going like up and down at the same time. So the red line is like going up and these like big red graphs here are like beyond planetary boundaries. So they're looking at like global scale. We just assuming that the demand functions and the patterns of consumption of different kinds of food don't change, but just modeling population growth and inc income growth, then our environmental pressures on greenhouse gases, cropland use, water, all moves us into this zone beyond planetary boundaries. And then they've tried to model the relationship between the food demand back to the environmental implications of food production and test which different strategies might bring those environmental impacts back into the sustainable uh, area. So they've got this reducing food loss and waste, uh, better technology, sort of, sort of increasing efficiency, changes in diets, some combination of those things. So, and then this is coming back down from the, what, we're, what they're estimating to be the actual impact uh, between now and like 2050, and then what's gonna maybe bring it back down, just to get some sense of relative efficiencies there. So again, you can't do that without modeling the food production system and food demand and food access all at the same time. So they're going sort of up the value chain as opposed to down. So putting that hard work um, also on a more micro level, look at look at these different kinds of simultaneous relationships, and um, just wanted to put this out there as well. Right after I started, um, uh, Ag Canada produced this uh, big policy document out of two years of consultations, coming up with a food policy for Canada, and it's very, I guess, interesting after doing all this work that it's coming from Ag Canada. So food policy sometimes is in the domain of public health, sometimes it's in, in a very different domain. But it's coming from Ag Canada, and I think that really speaks to uh, putting this conversation, putting these two things together. Like Ag Canada supporting this and coming up with this document means that they have some way or they're looking for ways to link up our systems of 
agricultural production and what our goals are there with our eventual goals on food. So this is uh, so this just came out, I think. It started in July, and it was like two weeks after it started or something. So um, it's, uh, I'm excited that I was, uh, I'm here, and I'm, I'm trying to find out more. I'm calling Ottawa a lot, trying to find out more <laughs> what this is and, and how to do it. And, but there's still not very good connections, because they were, they were surprised that I called them. Like, I'm, a, I'm in science and technology branch, and I'm calling the policy people. That's a very complicated conversation, so it's, there's a lot of clo open, open loops there. So I'm trying to close them up. Yes? It's, uh, so how is Health Canada taking this? They were a partner in, in, in yeah. putting it together, a Willing yes. partner? I not feel like <laughs> that. Not Politics, I have. I, d I just got here. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but like the data collection is switched, let's say, from mm -hmm. Health Canada to Ag Canada on food security, let's say. Mm -hmm. they like If you go back into surveys, it used to be Health Canada that was collecting the food security, and now Ag Canada is trying to collect it more. So I assume that was done willingly. <laughs> but, I, but I hope so, because I think it's important for